Joining us now to discuss reform of the World Trade Organization is the organization's spokesman, Keith Rockwell. He's in Geneva. John Gong is a professor of economics at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. From Rome, Uri Dadush is a non-resident scholar at Bruegel, a European think tank specializing in economics. And with us in the studio, Simon Lester is associate director of Cato Institute's Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Let me start with Keith at the WTO in Geneva. And Keith, let's start with the basics here. What exactly is the WTO? How does it work and uh, what are its main functions? Well, it's a forum for our 164 governments to meet. They come here, they negotiate new rules for trade. They look to settle their disputes. They examine, scrutinize, and discuss trade policy. And they discuss a whole range of issues involving trade, uh, very complex issues often. And it's really the place that sets the, the roadmap for, for global commerce. It provides the foundation, uh, a key foundation for the global economy that permits the, the stable and predictable flow of goods and services across borders. So Keith, let's look at an example. If we look at the current trade dispute, the tariff dispute that we're seeing right now between China and the United States, at what point will the WTO step in to try and resolve this? Well, the WTO has been very active all year. It's, it's broader than just those two members that you mentioned. As important as they are, there are many other players that are currently involved in the trade tensions at present. Uh, we've been involved in a number of ways. All of our committees are looking very closely at these issues, uh, be they questions of intellectual property, be they questions of dispute settlement reform, be they questions of the use of national security exemptions, whatever the issue may be, they're being discussed here formally and informally, and we, our dispute settlement mechanism has been extremely active. We've had almost uh, 30 cases brought here, that's the most in 16 years, and roughly 16 or so of these are directly related to the tensions that you mentioned. Right, all right, let me go to John Gong, he's in Beijing. And John, Chinese and European officials recently met to discuss reform of the World Trade Organization. These are countries, of course, that have been hit by tariffs by the United States. What kinds of reform would China like to see? I think it's, it's a very important from China's perspective that we still keep the WTO function as it has been always doing this in the past that we maintain a multilateral system here. I mean, there are signs from Washington that, you know, Donald Trump is probably thinking about putting out of WTO and is, and is using WTO only to the extent that it's uh, as a, around his position from a U.S. perspective. If it's not, it just uh, it totally ignores it. For example, these trade sanctions, in my opinion, clearly violates Article 25. Um, so, so these things um, will have to be, I guess, will have to be extensively discussed by the two sides uh, between uh, China and the European Union. I think China and European Union, are, for the most part, are the, you know, the, the last defenders that represent the bastion of uh, defense uh, you know, uh, uh, to protect the WTO against this onslaught from Washington. All right, John, you just mentioned Article 25. What is that? Well, Article 25 says that, uh, you know, for a country to initiate a, um, uh, these tariffs against another country, they have to go through a process at WTO. And they have to file a complaint at WTO as opposed to just unilaterally, you know, uh, 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 levy tariffs on another country. And to some extent, I think China's response to that, um, you know, the re re retaliations from Beijing, also, in a sense, you know, is, is in, in a sense a violation of the, uh, to Article 25 as well, in my opinion. Uri Dadush, what are Europe's concerns about the WTO and how it functions right now? Well, Europe is the world's largest trading bloc inside Europe, plus outside Europe, you add up all of the trade. It represents about a third of world trade or more. Uh, so they are extremely concerned about the viability of the WTO as a rule as a rule making body at the same time like the united states the european union would like to see uh, some reforms of the wto extension to various areas and they have similar concerns as the united states with respect in particular of uh, subsidies uh, and especially of state owned enterprises in china and other economies, but China is one of the big concerns. 
Simon, when we look at the United States' view on multilateralism, on international organizations, when we look at President Trump's view uh, on this, and he's talked about this more than once, uh, he has said that the United States would not be held accountable by, by what he termed uh, unelected international bureaucrats. Does he have a point? I don't think he has much of a point there. I think that if you, you look objectively at the World Trade Organization's dispute settlement mechanism and how it's ruled on cases, it's been pretty fair to everybody. Everybody's gotten um, you know, the same treatment. So complainants in WTO disputes uh, generally win because governments don't bring cases unless they're uh, pretty sure that they have a good case. Um, and, and respondents generally lose, and that's the case for the United States, for the European Union, for China, for Australia, for just about everybody. So, you know, the, the, it, there is always going to be, I think, a skepticism about the unfamiliar, you know, who are these uh, international bureaucrats? So I, I think it is natural to, to, to wonder about these things and be skeptical, but I think that when you look at the evidence um, of the treatment of uh, the United States versus others, I, I think that President Trump is, is misguided here. I think that the, 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 the data and the evidence shows that, you know, everyone one gets a, a fair shake in WTO dispute settlement. Keith, are member states of the WTO obliged, legally obliged, to abide by decisions taken there? Well, I, I don't want to get too much into this. The, the issues that we've mentioned, the specific cases that have been raised, these are currently subject to dispute settlement, and so we're not allowed to comment on them. Uh, generally speaking, though, what I can say is that these rules were drafted, they were negotiated and signed off on by the members themselves on the basis of consensus. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of these rules have, in fact, been, uh, been enshrined in, in national law by approval by, by parliaments or the U.S. Congress in the case of the United States. So these are things, it's a contract. All of these members have signed up to this, and they've committed themselves to carry out what it is they said that they would do. Simon, don't you find it a little bit surprising to hear these kinds of sentiments from President Trump when the United States was actually one of the primary architects of this international global trade structure that we see? Yeah, well, I think if you, if you look at the rules, they reflect uh, U.S. demands and values. So, for example, the strong intellectual property protections, that's something that uh, businesses in, in the United States ha have really pushed for. Um, but I, I think that you have to take into account President Trump has a, just a different historical perspective on all these things. You know, his reading of history is different than that of uh, most economists and, and economic historians. Um, so he's just, he's not starting from the same premises that everyone else is. And so, you know, if you look at it objectively, you could say, well, you know, doesn't he realize the, uh, all, all the great benefits? Uh, but he's looking at different metrics. He's looking at bilateral trade deficits. He believes those show that the United States got a bad deal. Um, almost every expert you talk to will disagree, but that, that's what he's basing his view on, not the, the same kind of evidence that the rest of us are looking at. John Gong, the Chinese Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, he recently talked about reform of the WTO, uh, and he said China wants three things in the reform process. One is that the core values of free trade must be upheld, the interests of developing countries should be respected, and there must be consensus through cooperation. Take us through these. Why are those ideas so important for China? Uh, I will first talk about the second point. I think you know, China still maintains, the, officially still maintains the position that uh, China is a, still a developing country. Uh, you know, China's GDP is uh, at about 10, 000, a little bit over $10,000 US dollars per capita. Uh, and uh, this is uh, you know, clearly falls in the category of developing countries. Um, and uh, although you know, China joined WTO claiming itself as a WTO, uh, as, a, as a developing country, without much, any, without hardly any uh, opposition to this position. But of course, you know, things have changed greatly over the last 17 years. And uh, uh, our living standard, our economic development has really taken a you know, great stride and, and, and we have reached such a, uh, this level. But still, it's still very much a, um, you know, unbalanced uh, development story here. I mean, we, you can just drive out of Beijing for an hour and run into places where, you know, you, it, it's, it's, it's really not looking like a, develop, a developing country. So, uh, developed country, I'm sorry. Uh, so clearly, you know, we, the government's position is that uh, we're still a uh, developing country and there are a lot of developing countries out there. So that these rules and regulations at WTO needs to reflect that fact. So I think, you know, that's uh, what he's coming from. But I, I still, you know, I have a slightly different perspective on this. I think this issue itself is subject to negotiation. I think, you know, my position is that, uh, you know, China's um, developed country status 
can be put on the table uh, for negotiation between the United States and China, for example. Um, but, but that's just my personal opinion on this issue here. Um, but, but anyway, I think uh, there's a still a very clear distinction between the developing world and the developed world. And the, and the trade obligations to WTO should be different, should be different. So I think that we still uh, should recognize this distinction and uh, the reform should also take into that perspective. Uri Dedush, uh, the uh, Director General of the WTO, he uh, has been talking about the trade tensions between China and the United States. This is what he had to say. Let's listen. We all know the risks of further escalation, uh, risks to the economy, risks to the trading system itself, which, by the way, would multiply the economic risks over the long term. We cannot let that happen. Uh, we need uh, trade and the trading system to play their full part in fueling growth, uh, just as they have done so effectively over the past seven decades. So, Uri, what, when you hear those comments, what does it tell you about the WTO's ability to resolve uh, the kind of disputes that we're seeing right now? Well, you know, as, as Keith Lockwell has said, the WTO is, uh, is an agglomeration of its members. It's a, it's a forum. It's a members-driven organization. And uh, uh, rules have been established, have been agreed. But in the end, uh, you know, uh, we have sovereign nations. And if they don't agree to submit to the, it, it, that the disciplines of the WTO, it's, uh, uh, and, and especially if that member is the United States, which is the world's most powerful uh, country, uh, militarily and uh, economically, uh, still today, uh, then it's very difficult to uh, uh, obligate members uh, to follow the rules. Um, uh, and so the WTO is in an extremely difficult situation at the moment because its disciplines are being challenged by precisely its most important member. And uh, uh, that is why you have this flurry of activity around WTO reform, which is originating in the European Union, it's originating in Canada, it's originating in China. People are looking very hard to see how this organization can be reformed in a way that uh, meets the needs of everybody beginning uh, with, uh, with the United States. Unfortunately, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, the United States, uh, the current United States administration, the people in charge of trade policy, really believe in the need for uh, a world trade organization and its disciplines. Whatever they might say, their actions, and actually they do say that, uh, but their actions belie a contempt, fundamentally, uh, for the precepts of the organization. That's very tough to deal with. Now, if it was a small country, uh, one could handle it. But with a large country, it's an existential problem. What are your thoughts on that, Simon? Uh, is there recognition, do you believe, in the United States that the world needs something like the WTO? So many of us in the trade policy community have been acting as amateur psychologists and trying to get into the heads of Donald Trump and the other uh, trade <laughs> leaders there to try to figure out what they really want here. And uh, I have to say, it's been difficult. You know, you, there are different interpretations. Um, sometimes I think, um, as, as others have suggested, well, maybe they just don't see the need for the WTO and they right. just like to pull out. Other times I think, no, this is just part of a negotiation. They're just putting pressure on. You know, they're, they're threatening to leave. They're blocking the appointment of uh, appeals judges. This is all designed to make everybody panic, uh, get a little bit desperate, and then in six months or a year from now, um, the Trump administration will come forward with a list of demands. Here's the things we really, really want. And these are things they couldn't have gotten a, a year ago or two years ago. Um, but if everybody's so, you know, so scared that the United States might abandon the system and, and worries that it can't function without the United States, then they'll be willing to, to cave in. Um, but, but, but really, the honest answer is we just don't know what's in their heads. We, we have a little experience now of seeing how um, they operated in other contexts, like the renegotiation of NAFTA. And so there, ultimately, um, they decided, they, they settled for a modest renegotiation. They talked about withdrawal, but they didn't withdraw. So you know, if we follow that pattern, uh, maybe sometime in the next year, we'll end up with modest reforms to the WTO. And I think we, we'd all end up being happy with that result. Sorry, I mean, if, if, you, if you think about this, 
There is no other route to resolving these ongoing disputes but through the WTO. There are too many actors, there are too many issues, very complex issues, on the table for this to be resolved in any other way. Now, the United States of America right now is, is shaking the tree and some fruits could be falling. The, the, the worry is that you don't want to shake the tree so hard that you kill it. Now, if we have a system that is going to be functioning, we need to have all the players committed to it. And certainly, reform is something that we do need. Now, what type of reform that might be, and, and let's, let's put decision making on the table as well. There are the Europeans and the Canadians have talked about reforming the way in which we decide. Perhaps some agreements could be reached with less than all of the members signing on. Now, on dispute settlement, this is, I think, for many of us, the biggest worry. We are now down to three appellate jurists, which are the minimum right. that you need to hear any appeal. By uh, December of next year, we'll be down to one, and the, dis and the appellate body would then cease to function, which would have knock-on effects for the rest of the dispute settlement system. Dispute settlement panel reports, for example, could not be adopted without the possibility of appeal. That creates a, 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 a system, a situation which is not something that I don't think the founders had foreseen, and we would be in uncharted waters then in terms of dispute settlement resolution. Would members take matters into their own hands? We don't know. John Gong, how does China view this dispute resolution mechanism, the fact that the court could be down to just one judge in, a very, uh, in just a few months? Uh, China has filed a complaint uh, with the WTO against the United States and its anti-dumping duties. I mean, how will something like that be resolved? I think there's a real likelihood that, you know, United States is ready, Donald Trump is ready to eviscerate this appellate body. Uh, I think there's a, is a actually, actually, my opinion, it's a highly likelihood that he's going to do something like this. And um, so if you ask me what's going to happen after that, um, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not an expert on these, you know, real intricacies of WTO rules, but my, my, my guess is that, you know, if we're down to one uh, member of this upper body, everything's got to hold up and, uh, um, and uh, you know, what's going to happen then? So that effectively is going to kill WTO. I think an, another development uh, that I view it is that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, USMCA, you know, there's a new um, uh, NAFTA, uh, the new version of the NAFTA agreement. It has this Article 32.10 in it. And I, in my opinion, if the uh, United States strikes, so similar to with Japan, which I think is quite likely, having this clause included in the deal, if it also has this thing with uh, the European Union, effectively, effectively we are going to have a WTO version 2.0. And you know, it's creating its own WTO, which is centered around the United States, around Washington, D.C. So I think that's a real danger here. And I'm not, I'm not sure it's actually in Europeans' interest of following the, the path uh, down the road. I, I, think, I hope that Germany and France are going to stand up <laughs> to, uh, to block that kind of attempt. Um, and I think uh, if that happens, you know, we're really going to talk about a scenario where the world is going to be divided into two camps. One is the America-led uh, trading bloc. One is a China-led trading bloc. And that's another version of the economic uh, a Cold War, um, and, and, and that's going to be horrible for the world. So I hope that's not going to happen, and I hope that uh, uh, we work together, China work together with the Europeans to, uh, to, uh, to stop Donald Trump from doing something crazy like this. Uri Dadush, you know, here we have an organization, 160 members, um, and as you pointed out, the WTO is in a difficult situation right now. It's under pressure. But if we look at the member states, I mean, which countries are the most vulnerable to this kind of dysfunction that we're seeing? Well, um, as you say, there are over 160 members uh, in the WTO. A very large number of them are uh, developing countries. And I think that if you don't have a, a functioning WTO, the uh, trade relations will be determined by power, relative power. In other words, how, how big is my threat, how big is my stick in trade relative to your stick in trade? And that's how, uh, in the end, disputes will, will proliferate and eventually be settled by power, uh, by power relations. In that context, um, the weakest are uh, developing countries that are relatively small, 
uh, and not I don't count China, of course, among those. Right. Uh, a country like China has a lot of power. Um, the European Union, which accounts for a huge part of world trade, as I said, has a lot of power. The United States has a lot of power. Um, countries that have bilateral agreements with the rest of the world, a lot of them will be able to count on those. I'm thinking of Chile, Mexico, Costa Rica, uh, etc., for to a degree. Uh, countries that are relatively small and don't have many bilateral agreements or regional agreements will be extremely vulnerable to the law of the jungle. Keith, we've been talking about the challenges that the WTO faces, uh, and as we've been saying, it's in a difficult situation. There's a trade dispute between the world's two biggest economies as well. But there are some voices which have expressed hope that this can be resolved. Let's listen to what uh, the managing director of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, had to say about this. Let's watch. We need to work together to de-escalate and resolve the current trade disputes. And while it is tempting to be a bit depressed about this perspective, I am actually hopeful because there is a clear appetite to improve and expand trade. Think of the flurry of welcome discussions and proposals to strengthen the WTO. Or think of all the new trade deals such as TPP 11, the regional African trade agreement and the progress made on the US-Mexico-Canada deal. So Keith, there we had Christine Lagarde. She's hopeful. Do you share that optimism? Well, I do. Um, uh, Madame Lagarde knows well how things work here. She's a former trade minister. Uh, what my boss, Roberto Azevedo, had to say, I, 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 of course, agree with that as well. But what I think is extremely important to keep in mind is that there is activity ongoing here. There are a series of talks underway in areas like electronic commerce, like how to facilitate the participation of smaller companies in the trading system, how to facilitate investment to lift development. All of the players that we've talked about are sitting in the same room discussing these issues. Um, you mentioned before that um, uh, one of the guests did, that the US has, has turned its back, but they've, they've actually brought seven disputes to the dispute settlement system this year. So it, it's, it's a little bit complicated to try and determine uh, where it is that people are going, but what's important is that they are sitting here and talking. They are going through these issues. They're raising the issues of national security. They're raising the issues of development, the issue of, of industrial subsidies, the question of state-owned enterprises, intellectual property. All of these issues are being taken up here. And when ministers meet, there'll be about uh, 15 or so ministers meeting in Ottawa uh, in later on this month. And these are the kinds of questions they're going to be taking up. What it is that they come back with when they come back here to Geneva, whether it's building on the EU plan that Uri mentioned or the Canadian plan or some of the suggestions that have arisen in the, Canadi in the uh, Chinese EU talks, it's too early to tell. But the fact that people are devoting this amount of energy and seriousness to this is, I think, cause for some encouragement. Okay, and that's where we're going to have to leave it. Uh, thanks to all of you for being with us. That's all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Chat with us about this or any of the show on Twitter. We're at CGTN America, or visit us on Facebook. That's at facebook.com slash CGTN America. I'm Arnold Nadu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.